moments. But I'm excited today to bring you a word um, before we start a new series next week. And if you're taking notes, anybody bring a hard copy Bible? Hard copy Bible. We're going to, like I said, Pastor Vince mentioned it, start bringing those, start bringing notebooks. We're going to dive in uh, this semester really deep, really heavy. I'm a firm believer that everybody should be taking notes and something that you can go back and reflect on. Because just because you hear it today and you meant mm, that was a good word, I love what, what, what the Spirit spoke through that, but I don't know if it was for me in this season, you can go back and you can recall, or maybe there's something for you to speak into someone. So take notes. Uh, there's actually stats that say that if you take notes, then you are 90% more likely to absorb what was spoken. And then there's another stat that 95% of stats are made up on the spot. Um, so just so, you, just so you know, but I'm a firm believer in you should take notes, whether it's physical, whether it's in your phone, uh, it, it doesn't matter. Just have something you can reflect on because it keeps you engaged. Um, so if you've got your notebook, you've got a phone, you've got something uh, authentically active, authentically active is what uh, the thought I want to preach from today. And it says this in Ephesians five, verse one, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I want to pray for us in this moment before we dive in any deeper. So if you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning, God, I thank you that we get to be in your house today. God, I thank you for how you've, you've arranged this encounter, God, for whatever anybody in this room is walking through today, God. I pray right now that these words would resonate in their hearts, in their minds, God. It would transform the way that they think, uh, how they live their daily life, God. God, that they would begin to reflect on who you created them to be, God, and what that looks like in their gifts and their talents and their abilities to bring you glory and honor, to go through this life, to downsize hell and to grow your kingdom. God, what everybody in this room is walking through right now, God, Lord, that they know that you've gone before them, God, that they have a victory in whatever they face because of the, de- the power of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God, I thank you that we get to be here today. God, I thank you that we get to lean into your word. God, I thank you for these beautiful people. God, I thank you for this church that we get to call home and all that you have in store. We give you the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen, amen. So I don't know about you, but um, I've had these moments in life that if you tell me, raise your hand, let me know, tell the person next to you. If you've ever had a moment where you saw something and you're like, man, that's just like too good to be true. It's just, that's just too good to be true. It's too good of a deal. I can't pass up on it, but, um, so I'm not going to, because I've just got to find out if it is too good to be true. So even though this may be a bad idea, like it, you know, you remember, I'm a shoe guy. Like I like fashion, I like shoes, I like that kind of stuff. I, like, I just like culture. Um, does anybody remember when they used to do the pop-up shops and do the shoes on the side of the road? Does anybody remember that? No? Okay, that may just be like an uh, Oklahoma thing, I guess. Like so, the fakes and, and the stuff. So, um, I'll just tell you that the Michael Jordan on the shoe did not look like the actual Michael Jordan. Um, like it was totally different direction. Um, but in these moments, you're like, this has, like, it's too good to be true. Uh, this happened a, a couple years ago. Like I, I buy shoes and I sell them and I move them and all this stuff, uh, just like so many other people do, which is all kinds of different things. Um, but a few years ago, uh, one of the guys I worked with, he was our location pastor at the, the previous church. Uh, him and I were, were flipping shoes and doing stuff back and forth. And I had a pastor friend in Cincinnati that was like, hey, bro, just so you know, I've got an in." I was like, you got an in? Like, what do you mean you got an in? Tell me more, tell me more. It's like, I'm the hookup. Like, I'm the plug. I'm the one that can get you any of the new Yeezy lineup that's coming out. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I got a guy that works at the factory in China, and they know. I'm like, man, this is too good to be true. But if you're telling me, and you're a pastor, and like, then obviously this is credible, right? So I I went up to to the other guy, and I was like, hey, man, listen, here's the deal. He's got this lined up. He's got the in, so we can actually get like three or four pairs now, and we can get them for the retail price. And since they haven't even came out yet, we can sell them for like triple, quadruple the price. And he's like, oh, I'm in. So we're like, okay, cool. So (laughs) we send send my buddy the money and all this, and and then we're waiting a couple months, and you know, because they're coming from China. And then this moment, and, and, and they come in, and we're like, yeah, like, 
smell check them, like these, yeah, they smell right, shape is right, all this kind of stuff. And so we start, we start sit, like putting them out and uh, I'm like, I'm going to hold them a little longer just to get some value. He's like, oh, I need cash now. So I'm going to sell them now. So there's this, this app called StockX. And how StockX works is you take a shoe and I'm giving you guys all kinds of like culture stuff that you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but this is good for you. Okay. I promise you 830. This is good for you. You need to know this stuff. This is an app that you can go and you can sell things on it, but bef- when you sell it, before it goes to the buyer, it first has to go through an authentication process. So they give you a label, you box it up, and then you send it and it goes to a StockX authentication place. So he boxes them up, he sells them, sends them. He's like, man, I'm just waiting on my check, waiting on that deposit to hit. And next thing you know, he comes in the next day and he's like, dude, you'll never guess what happened. It's like, what? He's like, so they actually took as much as I sold them for out of my account and blocked my account and shut me down because all three shoes were fake. Oh, my bad. (laughs) Too good to be true. But there's these moments that uh, we have so many times that we begin to walk through life and and this verse and says, be imitators of Christ. And I want to walk us through what this looks like and actually being a replication rather than just a replica, being an actual example of who Jesus is and being a follower of Jesus, being authentic in this moment. Because we have a whole lot more imitators than we do actual followers. Everybody thinks that they, they, they can be the thing that they're called to be, but they put more work into actually being a fake than they do into being the real thing. So I want to walk us through this today, and I've, I've got a couple jerseys up here. Now, I want to walk us through our identity, our value, and this authenticity. So um, I've learned that um, I guess I'm, I'm just kind of doomed for fakes, I guess. So this jersey right here, um, I'm an Oklahoma City Thunder fan. So one year for Christmas, I asked for uh, a Thunder jersey, Russell Westbrook, um, because he was the savior of Oklahoma City at the time. Um, rip Oklahoma City Thunder. I'm currently shopping for a new NBA team. Just kidding. I'll, I will go through the process of the rebuild. Um, but my, my mother-in-law, she's awesome. So she, she's like, I'm going to get you a jersey. I found it. I found it. I'm going to order them. I was like, okay, great. So she told me, hey, here's the jersey. She screenshot it and sent me in immediately. And I knew. I said, oh, no. I didn't say anything. But I waited. And then Christmas Day comes up. And the jersey's not there. She's like, I, I just don't know what's taking so long. It's coming from China. But it's just, I was like, oh, man. How did, you, how did you pay for it? Like, first off, did you Western Union it? Because don't. And, and so I, I didn't want to hurt her feelings. Uh, but I, I told her, I said, um, just so you know, when you show up, it's going to be fake. Like, it's not, it's not the authentic thing. If you look at them, uh, so you may not be able to see very well from there. But, like, the pattern is different in the fabric. This is red. Um, Oklahoma City Thunders are not red. They're orange is the color that they are. Uh, so just a little bit. Like, most people wouldn't be able to tell a difference. Um, but the one over there is an authentic, and uh, she got me that one to replace this one. This one's my brother-in-law's now. <laughs> so, um, but th- this process, and I was like, I felt bad for her, and because she was so excited to see the real thing and to obtain the real thing until it came in. And I think this is so much how how often our lives look like, and the things that we put out for people in front of us is we're saying, hey, I'm going to be an imitator. I'm going to be a replication. I'm going to be someone that looks like Christ, but I only look like it because I don't live like it. And we're leaving people in the wake because we're giving them such a fake encounter to the greatness of who Jesus is and can be to them in their life. Who he created them to be. The potentials and possibilities that he has for them. The fact that he died and rose again And yet we think we can just coast through life doing the bare minimum to make it look like we know what Jesus did for us. It says this in Psalms 139, 14. It says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. I love this verse because at the end there, it says, how well I know. If you know anything about David, he was a man after God's own heart. So in this moment, he's talking about how valuable and beautiful he is as God's creation. 
And in this moment, he's saying, I, I recognize how beautiful and marvelous your workmanship is and who you created me to be. Because I have spent time with you, even though I've made mistakes, even though I'm not the best, even though I've got all this garbage and these issues that I'm working through. I know that you have spent intentional time working on me as be crafting me as a masterpiece. I tell students this all the time that, that the scriptures say that you are a masterpiece. We look at God and he's the greatest creator of all time. He's the most beautiful artist and he's created all these things that we get to enjoy in beauty and splendor. But then he looks at us and he calls us his masterpiece, which a masterpiece is a creator's favorite work of art. It's their most valued possession. It's their most valued piece. And that's what he calls every single one of us. We talked last week about the fact that he not only breathes life into us, but he breathes existence into us in the moment of salvation. The old is gone, the new is here, the dead is gone, and the alive is now ready to move in your life because the Holy Spirit has now at work in you. You can now make a different decision and walk this process of being like Christ. But we don't walk the process because we think we can just look the part and that's going to be good enough. As long as everybody else thinks that I've got it together. Can I say some of you free in this moment? Just because you look like you have it together does not going to secure your eternity in heaven. Your eternity in heaven is only secured in professing from your mouth and believing from your heart that Jesus Christ died and rose for your sins, your transgressions, making you new, whole, complete, putting you on a path to purpose that he created for you in the moment that he knits you together in your mother's womb. When David says this, how well I know. He knows the number of hairs that are on your head. He, he spent intentional moments before you even thought about. He knew what your purpose was going to be. He knew what your plan was going to be. All these things take place in the passion that God has for you, but yet we discredit it because we say, we can, uh, I think I can just do enough to get by for a few days. I think I can just do enough to make it look like I can get to Sunday because I haven't spent time on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So why, though, are we so, like, okay with just getting the replica? Some of us, you're like, the replica I get is Dr. Thunder, Mountain Lightning, and Sam's Cola. That's the replica I get. We have a standard here at Real Life Church that, that we, we teach interns and we teach people who will walk through the doors is, is we don't do the bare minimum. We have a value that's we refuse to be good which means when you walk through the doors that you're not going to get great value water. You're going to get Aquafina or Dasani or something that says, hey, I'm going to go the extra step for you. We're going to bring name brand sodas because we believe that there is more to what just getting the replica in these moments. We want to make sure that you get the real thing from the platform through the experience. And so in these moments, though, we begin to look and we say, well, I can take the easy way out. Easy is selfish. Easy is selfish, and there's no ifs, ands, buts, any other way around it. The only thing, the only person that easy benefits is Satan. It's the only person that it benefits. He's the one that's actually taking easy routes as well. Because when you look at easy, you don't get to go through the refining process. You don't get to go through the steps that God's calling you to. You don't get to rise to the potentials that he created for you. All these things. You say, you know what? Uh, I can do the bare minimum and I can get by because the confidence I actually have in myself is the bare minimum. We have these moments and, and we discount and we discredit the value that Jesus has placed upon us. When it comes to anything in the world that you see, the value on something what value is, is however much someone puts upon it. It's how much someone is willing to pay for it. So if we are so valuable that the creator of heaven and earth would step out of heaven, walk upon the dirt that we walk every single day, knowing that we cannot do the things right enough, well enough, good enough, that he's going to die on a cross for our sins, He's going he's gonna to carry our shame, our guilt, because we are so valuable to him that he's going to step out of heaven, walk the earth, and be a sacrifice for every single one of us. That's where we go from being just an imitator to being like and being one. 
It's such a beautiful image. And I think we give people, we, we discount ourselves so many times because every single day you are made new in the image of Jesus. You have the opportunity to wake up and say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for raising me from the dead. I know yesterday I screwed up and I'm a mess up, but today I'm going to be better and I'm going to be like you. Your value that you have placed on me is so substantial that you actually died on the cross for my sins. And today I want to live in a way that brings you value in that because that's where my identity and my value is. This is so great that he died for us. But yet we still try to fake it until we make it. But what are we even trying to make it to? What are we trying to make it to? Fake is cheap. It doesn't last. It doesn't hold up. There's some of you here that, uh, you know, you, you'll go buy some stuff and it'll look like something else, but in a year or so, it's not going to hold up because it's not the real thing. There's not the craftsmanship. There's not the intentionality. There's not the purpose to it. Fake is cheap. Fake doesn't really have any value. It, it can't be used to the extent that it was created to be used because it's not going to withstand the test. But yet we treat our lives like this so often. Can you imagine what it feels like when God begins to look at us and he says, I have placed such value upon your life that I died for you. But you disregard it because you are not intentional enough to spend a moment with me to let me show you how valuable you truly are. And we begin this process of being fake and the, the process of being fake, it becomes exhausting. Where there's a reward in being real and God changing us and transforming us through this process, we spend more time trying to put on a facade and become so hard to keep up with rather than just being real with God and the people around us saying, hey, I'm broken, but he's gonna make me whole. That I'm hurting in this moment, but I'm gonna walk the process because I know he's gone before me and bringing victory in whatever I face. And yet God sits there and says, you don't even recognize how much value I've placed upon you because you sit there and you disregard it in these moments. But the fact that we actually get value from who Jesus created us to be in his death, power, burial, and resurrection. You see, what's crazy about these jerseys is like this one, this one right here, it looks like it's ready to go. It looks like it can be used. But in reality, it's just an imitation. It's just for a person that's a fan, someone that's never going to get in the game, someone that's only going to be able to be a, a, a person from the sideline that watches someone do the thing they work so hard to do, to, to be a person that screams at the TV when the person that's paid millions of dollars makes the mistake. I saw a meme the other day, and it really made me laugh. Is it said, guys really pick teams at 11 years old and let it ruin the rest of their lives. And I was like, oh, man, like this is not the season for me to be reading that. And... But, but fans can wear something that looks similar. But it's never going to be used in a moment that actually is significant. See, people are drawn to real. We're in a, in a, in a season of life and in culture that everything is filtered. And we go from being it's so filtered that once you get through the process that it doesn't even look real anymore. My, my wife is super into makeup videos. And she'll be like, hey, watch this person as, as they begin. I'm like, that's not even the same person. Like, I don't even think that one that's the result looks good. I won't even mention the one before the result. But it, it, like, we put so much effort into appeasing other people that have no value or authority in our lives. But this process that we walk out so often, we put so much effort into impress those around us rather than being obedient to the creator of who we are. But our value comes from the impression we think rather than the obedience and the promise of God. Rather than actually being in the game 
and saying, hey, God, use me. Lead me, work me in a way so I can be battle tested and battle ready. So when the enemy walks in, I say, hey, no, I'm in the game. I know my coach. I know the GM. I know the owner of what I'm walking into. And I know that I can face it because I am real and authentic. And that's what I'm going to put forth. There's a great story. There's a great story in in the Bible. And the thing that you're holding, and, and there was this young man that at one point in his life, he walked up to his dad and he said, hey dad, I want you to know that I'm good. I want to go out and I want to see everything that the world has for me. If you would just give me my blessing and I'll go out and I, I'm good now. Thank you for everything you've done. Actually, he probably didn't even say thank you. He just said, hey, give me what's mine. And so the scriptures say that he goes out and he squanders the blessing. And he squanders it. So he goes out and he goes to find things that he thinks is going to bring him satisfaction and wholeness. And he goes to experience the real world until he realizes it's so fake that he's now left with nothing. And he says, I don't know where I'm at. I don't know what I'm doing, but I know I've got to go back to the place that placed value upon me. Are you placing value upon people in your life that when they walk away, they know that they can come back? You say, I see that you're a child of God and I believe in you. Even though there was a season that you made some mistakes, there was a season that I didn't agree with what you did, but I love you so much because I know Jesus loves you so much that when you make that turn to come back, that I will meet you at the end of the road and celebrate the fact that you are home. Because that is the value that Jesus has placed on every single one of us. He went out, he, he saw fake, he, it exhausted him. He was in a moment where he was eating with the pigs and he said, I got to go home. And when he went home, they threw a party. They celebrated him. They, they put a ring on his finger. But then there was a brother that said, why would we do this? He threw everything away for nothing that was real. There was no return on what took place. And the father said, once was dead is now alive. The lost is now found. And now in this moment, we are going to celebrate the fact that he has came home because just as much as I value the fact that you have stayed steadfast and walked with me, I value him because he is my son as well. As much as Jesus values you, the one that's consistent in your daily, that's consistent in operating your gifting, the one that's consistent in serving, as much as Jesus values you, he values the person next to you that's walking through the grime just as much because we are all children of God. But are you showing that value to when that person comes back, you celebrate them, or are you the one person that's going, why are they here? Let me tell you this right now, church. This place is full of broken people. Because the church should be the hospital for the hurting. It should be a place for the broken to come and find. Because when we walk through the doors, we say, hey, I was once in your spot. So let me show you how good Jesus is and the potentials that he has for you. If you would walk with him through the seasons rather than just running away from them. But in these moments, we forget the fact that that takes work. It takes work. You know what the definition of counterfeit is of what fake is? It means to imitate without permission. To imitate without permission. What's beautiful about the gospel is that Jesus is saying, you can be like me. Because the old you is gone and the new is here. You have grace, you have freedom in whatever you face. I'm not saying that there's so much grace that you can make mistake after mistake after mistake. And Jesus is going to cover that. No, he changes you so you don't keep making that mistake. And it's crazy how the enemy works because he can twist that in our mind to say, hey, you have so much freedom and so much grace that it doesn't matter what you do because God's always going to be there. And he's saying, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. God's saying, I have so much grace and so much freedom that I want to keep you from doing that ever again. Not for you to keep doing it, just for keep forgiving No, I don't want to see it in your life anymore because you are beyond that and you are better than that because you've surrendered yourself to all that I have for you. To be engaged, to be able to be in this moment, real is more than just regular. Authentic is active. You see these jerseys up here, this one, like I said, like the material's different. 
It, it's kind of heavier. It's itchy. It doesn't feel right. The, the pattern of the mesh is totally different. But this one over here, this one is authentic. This one has been tested. Engineers have, have taken this and picked the materials. There's actually a stitching on the back that's totally different than the stitching on the back of this one so that it fits on the shoulders of the player right. This material is lighter. The way that the, 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 the letters and the number are put on the jersey are different. That way, when they know that they put this jersey on, it's ready for them to go into the game. Where this one just looks like someone is ready, it's not going to hold up. It's not going to fit right. It's not going to do the right thing. It's not made to the specs of the professional. Where this one, you could say, uh, you, could, you could have this one laying over there and their jersey gets ripped. And you say, hey, I got you. Just go throw this one on. See how that works out for you. Works for you at NBA Arena. It's probably not going to, but you can at least try it. But this one, they could actually put on and it's ready for them to be in. If you were to be, reflect in your life, is your jersey one that looks like, you know what? It looks like I could go in the game, but as soon as I get put in the game, I don't know if I can make it. Because I haven't gone through the testing. I haven't gone through the process. I haven't spent time for God to work on me, to show me how I can get through these things. I think it's so crazy, the fact that Jesus spent intentional moments with God, the Father, 40 days knowing that the test was coming. It says, it says in, in this story that Jesus went into the wilderness preparing for the test. Which means that if Jesus was going to be tested, and he had to spend intentional time with God the Father to be prepared for the test, why don't we? To be able to see the potentials that he has from us. The, 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 to be authentic and to be real. That jersey can go in the game because authenticity and action take preparation and practice. We begin to have the debate and talk about the greatest basketball player of all times is Michael Jordan. The greatest of all times. But Michael Jordan never did the bare minimum. He didn't just go through practice. Hey, we're going to practice for two hours today. And then, all right, cool. See you guys later. Kobe Bryant never just showed up to practice and that was it. Kobe Bryant flew in, got to workouts at five in the morning, did workouts, went home for breakfast, came back for team workouts, went home and picked up the kids, and then came back for shoot around game. The reason that those athletes were the level they were is because they went above and beyond in preparation and practice. And yet we think we can do the bare minimum to get through life when the enemy's doing everything he can to attack us, doing everything he can to wipe out a complete generation following behind us. But yet we're saying, you know, I, I can skip this moment. I can skip church today. I don't have to serve. I don't have to lead my kids in a quiet time. I don't have to listen to the right kind of music uh, in a regular rotation. We dismiss these things and then we're not going to be able to participate or be prepared when the test comes. It says this in 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 9. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though through its tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And rejoice with the joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls to endure the trials so that you can worship and see the goodness of God because you cannot see him physically visibly but you know that he is in your midst when you begin to walk through the moment you can see as you get to the other side that God I am stronger I am better I have endured I've been created in a way you've gone before me to make a way for every victory every trial that I am going to face to be active in these moments. Authentic is tested and it's endured. One of the great things about teams is that for a team to be great, every person on the team has to be bought in. 
They've got to follow the mission. They know the playbook. They know the, the, the plan behind what they do. They know the style of play. They know the heart and they know the mission of the coach. They know the overall direction of the organization and they are all bought in on one mission. And it's to go and to be the best that they can and to win. But yet we sit and we've been created by the creator of the universe. We sit and we look across the room and we see like-minded people, people that, are, have, that have the same heart, same mission as us, to go and reach the lost and the broken. But yet some of us sit and we're not bought in because they're better than I am. So I'm just going to go let them do more of the work. I'm going to let them be the ones that get all the victories when Jesus is saying, oh, I want you to be celebrated and to celebrate with me as well because I have great things in store for you because I've done a great thing in you. So is, are you bought in to these moments? Are you bought into the fact that we are called, every single one of us are called in the ministry to go? It's why we use the phrase at Real Life Church, partnership and non-membership. Everybody has a responsibility to reach people, not just a right to sit in a seat and worship on a Sunday morning. Are you in the game? Are you ready to put the jersey on? Or are you just kind of sit back and say, you know what? I think this is going to be good enough. God wants to use every single one of us but not every single one of us are bought in and surrendered to what he has in store for us. You see, we wonder so many times why we feel like this. Why we feel like we just keep getting attacked and we keep facing the same struggle, we keep facing the same heartache. It's because we've never fully surrendered what we have. We may have said yes to Jesus and believe that he's the Boston rescuer, he's the Lord of all in our life. But there are still some things that I'm holding on to because for so long in my life, they define me. For so long in my life, they've been my identity. For so long in my life, this is what people have labeled me as, so this is what I'm always going to be. And Jesus is saying, no, if you would surrender yourself completely to me, you have no idea to the capacity that I could use you to grow my kingdom. But are you bought in to this? Do you truly believe that Jesus can do a work in your life? Has the enemy done such a work in yours that you're blinded and clouded from the things that are so good in your life? The fact that you woke up this morning and Jesus has something in store for you. If you would say, I'm here, I'm available. I want to be obedient to the call of God on my life. Are you bought in? Do you practice? Do you work? You see, Romans 12 says, let love be genuine detest what is evil, and cling to what is good. Cling to what is good. Detest evil and cling to what is good. So many times in life we find ourselves just kind of being passive about the evil and trying to cling to what is good. We're not saying, hey, this is not good for me at all. I need to get it totally out of my life, whether it's a relationship, whether it's an addiction, whether it's just eating too much food, whatever it might be. This is not good for me. I need to, I need to push it completely out of my life. We just kind of let it sit there and be in our storage unit. And if we might actually go check on it and make sure it's still there. Rather than saying, God, I don't need this anymore. And the only way I can get rid of it is if you take it away from me. And completely surrender ourselves in these moments and say, God, I'm broken, but I want you to make me whole. God, I'm hurting and I need healing. God, I feel lonely and I need you to show me that you are here. We've got a generation that's rising up. And we keep saying things like, you know, they are going in such a different direction. And I'm not really sure where they got offline, where the path shifted. Church, my question is, if we're worried about them going in a complete direction, where is it that we started paving the road in a different direction or we stopped being the guide for them? Where is it we were stopped being intentional with saying, hey, these are the things that should be a standard in your relationship. 
these are the things that should be a standard in your life. This should be the expectation of a work ethic. This is, your, how, this is how you honor God in your relationships. This is how you honor your father and your mother. This is how you walk in confidence and faith because of who God created you to be. Where did we get it off that we got lazy in what we were doing and just expected them to follow on rather being intentional in the teaching? Because now we have generations that are following that are so confused on which direction to go. Because somewhere we've missed the fact that we paved the way. Not only do we expect them to follow us, but they're gonna follow us in whatever direction we take them. So where did we get off in that? We wanna see leaders of homes and we wanna see marriages that are flourishing, men that rise up to lead their home. But yet we have men that are lacking in confidence in who God created them to be, so they don't know how to lead their homes. So now we have young men that are rising up uncertain of how to even walk in life. We have young ladies that have moms that have never placed true value on their life because they've never recognized that they're a true daughter of the one true king. And so they've never respected themselves and honored themselves in a way that now their daughter says, no, this is going to be the standard of how I live because I watched it before me. Because we've got complacent and just walking with culture rather than saying, no, we're going to change what the culture says is the norm. And we're going to go back to what the Bible says in the authentic and real of who I am. No, I may, I may mess it up sometimes, but I know the fact that Jesus died for me. So tomorrow I can be better than I was today. And I can be transformed in the fact that I can be better every single day because what was gone, what was there is now gone and the dead is now gone. And I am alive in Christ Jesus because he's breathed life and existence into me because of the power of the cross. But we're going to be complacent with culture. And we can just look like we can get in the game. Because when you get in the game, it gets really, really hard. And sometimes you get yelled at. And sometimes you get knocked down. And there's always somebody that's trying to beat you. But you know what's great about being in the game is you win. No matter what, when you are in the game with Jesus, you win. You just have to endure the trial, endure the test, endure the moment, and know that he has set something in front of you in the word of God that is relevant to whatever you face if you would spend intentional time in it. I want to close with this because we're going to get to do this tonight. And I think there's going to be a lot of people that need to take this step of obedience. One of the things that's so interesting about church is we debate about the trivial and the how-to. And in the debating of the trivial and the how-to, we miss the fact that some of the stuff is so concrete and just the belief of it. And one of these things is baptism. Like the church believes in baptism. How you go about it may be a little different. But the fact that Jesus was once baptized, he was immersed into the water and he was raised back to say, hey, this is my ministry. This is my mission. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the jersey on so that everybody watching knows that I'm in this, that I have a purpose for my life and that I'm here. I'm not talking about being like sprinkled as a baby so where your parents are saying, hey, we're going to raise this person in a home that's going to be filled with love and all this kind of stuff. No, I'm saying that you have made a decision to let everybody else know that Jesus has changed your life, that you are going to be authentic and real and active in your daily life and following Jesus. And then tonight I want us to, to walk through this to see baptism is the first step of obedience. It's the first sign of surrender. It's the first sign of saying, hey, I'm bought in, I'm all in. I'm gonna show everybody else that I can be held accountable, that I'm gonna put the work in, that I'm gonna do everything I can to grow the kingdom of God. And, and I'm gonna be a real part of this team and I'm gonna put this jersey on rather than just kind of coasting through life and making it look like that. I know my color's a little off. I know the material's wrong. I know I, I can't go in the game, but at least I can look like I can go in the game. No, I'm tired of that. I wanna show everybody that I'm in it. And the reason that we do this is because, number one, Jesus displayed it. Jesus displayed it. If it was so great that Jesus actually walked in obedience to be baptized, then why don't we? Just like Jesus spent time with God the Father to be prepared for the test, why wouldn't we? 
So if Jesus said, hey, walk into the water and John the Baptist said, no, you should be the one baptizing me. He said, no, I am following through with what God has for me. And the moment he was baptized, he was dunked in the water and he was brought back up and the dove ascended on the Holy Spirit. And all these things transpired to show people that this is the standard to follow. Jesus did it. He commands it. He says, go into all the nations, proclaiming the gospel, raising up disciples, and baptizing them in all the nations. He commands it. And then the church follows it. It says this in Acts 2, 36-39. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children. And for all who are far off, everyone from the Lord of God, call, our Lord God, calls to himself. Repent and be baptized. Some of you haven't done it because I don't know what everyone else would think because I did it when I was a kid. Or I did it just a few years ago. Or what is the moment? When did your ministry, when did you begin to say, I'm going to be obedient to the call of God in my life. I'm going to go and reach my workplace. I'm going to reach my family. I'm going to show them every single day that I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. That I'm tired of being fake. And I want to be a true representation of Jesus. Some of you need to walk through and follow through with that moment of obedience. One of my favorite parts of baptism is the fact that you find out that you are not in it alone because we get to celebrate the fact that you are now walking in confidence and boldness who Jesus created you to be. Walking in confidence and boldness in the fact that he died and rose for you in this moment. It says that in Luke that heaven rejoices more over one than all of heaven and earth combined. So if one person we get to celebrate with, it's worth it. Some of you may have been warring with this, and some of you, this may be totally new to you, you say, but I want to walk in obedience to Jesus, what Jesus did. We're going to offer baptism tonight at Welcome to Real Life, 6 o'clock. If you're interested, you can go get signed up at the Connect counter. Just tell them what size shirt you need in the form. Uh, bring some short change of clothes. And we'll, we'll celebrate with you. But some of you also in this moment today, you're saying, you know, I'm tired of exhausting myself just to make it look like I can go in the game because when someone asks me something, I get really scared and terrified because I'm not prepared. Some of you are saying, I'm really scared of being authentic and real because that means I'm going to be active and ready to get in the game. Some of you are saying, you know what, for the first time in my life, I want to be a part of something. I need to follow Jesus and be on the team. You need to walk or take your seat or walk to the front and walk through the process of saying yes to Jesus for the first time in your life. Every head bowed and your back closed in the room today. I want to pray for us. Today, if, if you want to say yes to Jesus, these altars are open and someone will pray with you. You can walk up at any moment in time and someone will walk with you through this moment and lead you through a prayer of salvation. And then some of you in this moment are saying, you know, I just need to be authentic and I need to be real and I need to recognize that if something was in front of me, I wouldn't be ready for it. Because I've tried to fake it, and I don't even know what I'm faking it for. Because there's no reward for that. There's only a reward for authentic and real. To be able to, to show people that I am like Christ. It's one of the beautiful things that Paul did and repeated and repeated. As I strive to be like Christ, and then some of you need to sign up for baptism and come celebrate with us tonight. Let everybody else know that you're in it for real. That the old is gone, the new is here, that you're going to go and you're going to grow the kingdom of God. You're going to go and you're going to grow into who God created you to be. You're going to completely surrender and be obedient to the call of God on your life. 